with the wonderful job she's done in Tabernacle. And it, we all pumped up all great. Just like the thing I said, when, if you go, can we go back next week? Let's finish Tabernacle. So we can go back up. So I was always, when I was always doing different uh, training and speaking, I, it was always hard to get one of the dynamic speakers and follow the one. And that's okay. I've got good stuff too. There we go. I just thought uh, Chuck and Rich was, they're all getting excited. They're like, <laughs> look, now I have my mic on now, so they'll, they'll stop waving at me. Okay, uh, if you take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 10, we're going to, we're, this is going to be our starting point. Uh, and as the Lord gave me this message, and I was like, well, I don't know, this would be appropriate. And, but with everything going on, especially with the shooting in Uvalde, I think this is very appropriate tonight. Uh, if I had a, if for the title of the message, it's the five F's to abundance of life that we can learn from Paul. John chapter 10 beginning in verse number 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this day that you've given. We just ask now that you would use me as your message, messenger for this message, and Father, that you might be lifted up and you might be glorified. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus is talking to his disciples here, and verse number 10, he says at the end of that verse, he says, I am come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. Now, if you ask people today, how's their life going? Very few people will go, oh, life is great, everything is wonderful. You know, I work, work myself to death. I get home, and I have to do more stuff. I have to clean and do all this kind of stuff. And, you know, life can't get any better than this. If it got any better, I don't know what would happen. But when we look around it, we realize that who is this more abundant life for that Jesus is talking about? It's not for those outside the church. It's for his sheep. It's, you know, in... We say this a lot, and a lot of times I think it gets overlooked. We are only here for a short period of time. You know, if, if Paul said, if, if I had hope in this life only, I'd be of most men most miserable. If this is all that I had, I don't care if I had the best uh, house, the best car, money I did, was an object, I could live and do whatever I wanted to, travel around the world, and but if that was it, that's all I had. That's not a life more abundant. And everybody's like, oh, this is, and we lift up these athletes, these movie stars, these business people. All these, we lift them up, and it's like, oh, if I only had this or only had that, I, get, I life would be good. But he says, I am the, very, very, in verse 7, I, I am the door of the sheep. When he's talking about that life abundant, he's talking about the sheep. The Apostle Paul gives us some key points from his life on what he did to make it better. You find these through his letters to the churches. He doesn't just list them out on, in a certain point and say, oh, here's a list, let me just go through this. Uh, he addresses them as it came, if it comes up. He brings up points that where people need them the most. 
As I said, I call this the five F's of Paul's abundant life. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Uh, God, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, penned the Word of God to most of the local new churches that were started. Paul's writing deals with the local churches more than anyone. And who are we? We're the local church here in Westchester, Ohio. And what I always find amazing as I'm reading through all of Paul's letters and different things to the churches, 2,000 years plus, it's as still relevant today as it was back in Paul's day. The lessons that he tried to teach young pa- preachers, young pastors, young, the churches starting out, all those lessons that he bestowed upon them, they're the same for us. The same thing that we have. Uh, the first step I want to list out here, I'm, I list this first so not to forget it, it's forgetting. Philippians 3, uh, uh, verses 13 and 14. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend, apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Did Paul have some things that he would like to forget? I'm sure he did. Just think about Paul when he first started out. Paul had learned what he thought was the best way from the greatest teachers of his day. And then here comes this thing started up about these Christians and this Jesus. And Paul says, I'm going to put a stop to this, and I'm going to stop it. But on the road to Damascus, he got a whole new outlook on life. He got saved, and he goes, oh, now I know. Because Paul had spent time spreading terror in the early churches, ripping families apart and having many killed, holding the coats of the ones as they stoned Stephen. I asked you tonight, do you have some things you'd like to forget? You know, a lot of times people try to make a ministry out of their past uh, life before they got saved. If God forgot it and forgave it, why why do people keep wanting to bring it up for? But here's the part for abundant living. We, need to, we have to forget those things. Now, it's getting to the point where, not to the point where it was said, well, you know, as Paul said, you know, we don't have to worry about the sin. We got grace, so we'll just keep sinning and we'll have more grace. But Paul said in Romans, he says, shall sin abound? Should we have that much more sin that grace may abound? And he said it several times in the book of Romans. God forbid. He wants us to live a life, but yes, we can't live a life dwelling in the past. You know who wants you to live in the past? Satan. He wants you, he wants you every time you start doing something good for the Lord, and you start climbing that hill and you start getting to the top of that mountain, all he, he's pulling on your shoulder going, hey, look. That's, that's where you're at. That's, remember that? Remember that? Remember what, what, what was happening there? But what is really amazing is that we serve a God. Once we get saved, not only did He forgive it, He forgot it. Not, you know, a lot of times people say, well, we just want to make... How do you know? Well, we looked at the Word of God in Psalms 103, 12. He says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgression from us. God has forgiven our sin past, present, and future. Are those sins still there? In God, no. Because they're covered in the blood. And He can't look past, you know, a lot of times I've, I've seen uh, churches hand out, uh, have little games that, uh, in Alaska they had one. I think I mentioned this before. 
He says, there's three things that God can't do. Can you name them? God can't lie. God can't change. And God can't ha- allow sinners into heaven. That was their thing. I said, but you know, the thing about you're missing here is that God can't, doesn't forgive sin because God is holy. Sin had to have a price, and Jesus Christ paid that price on Calvary. In our minds, they come back. Because, like I said, Satan wants to keep them back in our mind. But when he throws them up to God, just like the song, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember those anymore. Because they're under the blood. And Paul said, if you want to have an abundant life, you're going to have to forget, and you're going to have to press towards the mark. Because can, none of us have that DeLorean that we can go back in the past and change things. Now, we can learn. I always told my son this. You can learn from things that you messed up on, but you, you can never change it. You can't rewrite history. Even though they're trying a lot today, you can't rewrite history. It's going to be there. You learn from it, and you move on. You know, on a side note, it baffles me that most people sitting in churches today don't know how far the east is from the west. It's real simple. This far. All the way. When he went to Calvary, he covered it all. East from the, all the way. The second F is found in 2 Timothy 4.16. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Second up is fighting. Paul, at the end of his life, reminded Timothy that he would soon be going home. But Timothy would remain behind and he would be in a fight. I remind you tonight, we still have that fight tonight. What's the fight, you say? We are fighting for every lost soul in Westchester, Ohio and around the world through the missionaries that we support. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses in high places. The world today, controlled by Satan, is trying to get our minds fighting with each other, getting us to fighting about Life on this planet, the high prices of gas, inflation, and who is and who's not to blame. Anything to keep our minds off the real fight. Because as Christians, we only have one fight. Lost souls on their way to hell, and having churches and preachers focus more on these fights. Instead of preaching the Word of God. We want want preachers to get... uh, Let's don't focus on the Word of God. Me sitting up here reading a newspaper to you is not going to save anybody. Me up here on social media, all the stuff that flows through this thing is not going to help anybody. It's, go, it's going to bring you down. Because we need to stand on the Word of God and stand on the doctrine, which is the Word of God. And that's what the fight is. Because if we lose that fight... Countless souls are going to be in hell, the ones that we can reach out to. The third F is very vital to the first two. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more, as you see the day approaching. The third F is fellowship. We need fellowship. We need fellowship more than any more today than I think any, any part of the church age ever had. You want to be prepared to grow in the Christian life and be ready for the daily spiritual fights that will come. Not only do you need that fellowship with the Lord in your Bible studies and your prayer time. But you also need that Christian fellowship when we come and gather on Wednesday nights, Sunday school, and for for Sunday services. We need that to get the fellowship and the good preaching and teaching from the Word of God. 
And in the military, we had a saying, if you want to get something, you know how you get it? You show up. You come on board. You're there. Notice there that this is an action verb, just like in, in uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Action words are not a suggestion. They're commands. When we was in Alaska, they had one of the, uh, the legal uh, squadron. Everybody in the military, all your squadrons have these slogans. And when they would win an award, their slogan was, it's not a suggestion, it's the law. You have to follow it. And when Lord puts out these commands, when He says, show up, study, those are not suggestions. Those are commands for a Christian life. Those are action words. And I know you hear it a lot. He says, you don't understand, preacher. I have a reason I can't be there. See, I know that there's reasons. Uh, the people, sometimes people don't show up, but God knows the difference between reasons and the excuses. For the last two and a half, one and a half years, the virus has been the elf, elephant in the room nobody wants to address. There's times that people need to be, you know, if people are sick. Now, I grew up in the country, and... I think I've got exposed to every known virus or anything because the mentality back then, when I was growing up, it didn't matter if you, as long as you could breathe and you had a rag that you could, you could keep your nose clean, show up. Share that virus. If you had, if you had measles, break, you take that kid with the measles, you throw him in with other 10 people who hadn't had it. You share it. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, if you're sick, please, like when I've been sick, I stayed home. And we are very blessed and very fortunate that we have the media that I can, you know, listen to this sermon and I can be part of it. And it, I liked it and it's great. Especially when I get uh, ripped away to Columbus on Wednesday nights and I can't be here because of my job. I can catch up and stay up on the teaching of the tabernacle with the pastors been going over. But that's not what, what we need to be. If we have the ability to be here, we need to have these chairs. We, we, ha, we all have our chairs. We all sit in our little spot. We need to be there. That's where when we show up and we have that fellowship, you know, because I can, I can be feeling low and, you know, it's like, wow, I've had a really bad day. I've had a really bad week. I get in here and start shaking hands, starts getting hugs. I'm like, wow, this is what I need. You know, how those people go through the whole week from Sunday back to Sunday, I don't know how they do it. I'll tell you right now, they don't have enough, tank, enough in their tank uh, to get them where they need to be. That they're not going to be living that abundant life. Uh, the fourth F is fruit. Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You know, Serenity has great plans for outreach over the summer months, but it's going to take people. It's going to take people helping out. Now, I grew up in, in the country. We had a, from the time I can remember, I was, we had a garden. And we've had people that had uh, watermelon fields and stuff. And one of the saddest things that I've seen, we had a, uh, I lived in a little town called Addison, and you go to Coleman, and about halfway between Addison and Coleman, this farmer had a watermelon field. Now, he was of the mindset that if he couldn't sell his watermelons, he just let them rot on the vine. And you'd go through there, and I was like, what a waste. 
All that, all those watermelons that people could use, you know, cut the price, do something. If you know, nobody's, you know, back then, watermelons were like two, three bucks, and they were really good. He had some of the best watermelons you could get. But you drive by there about June, end of June, middle of July, and you know, he'd always he wouldn't pick them until somebody he'd have maybe five or six out on the side of the road, but they would stay on the vines. You know, those people of the harvest, that's the fruit that's ready. Ready to be witnessed to, prayed for, and hopefully led to the Lord. What a sad thing it is to see. As Jesus looks down, He says, the harvest is ripe, it's ready. All we need is somebody to go talk to Him. You know, the car show coming up in June. Uh, that I, I wore my legs out walking and talking to people at, at that last year. It's like, oh, is this just a car show? I'm telling you right now, it is great because it's good outreach. Like I said, it's sad to see fruit wasted and not con- and not consumed, not been eaten. But it's much worse to those souls that could be reached, perish because we didn't show up to do the work. The last F is found in Luke chapter 12, 48b. It's for unto whomsoever much is given of him, much shall be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Last thing I want to focus on tonight is faithfulness. We know without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. We know Paul didn't focus on the past. He pressed towards the future. We know Paul fought a good fight. We know Paul preached about the importance of fellowship and being in church. We know Paul cared about the harvest. One example. In Acts chapter 17, verse 16. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Paul was faithful to the end. Here at Serenity, we have been given much. You say, what are you talking about? Now, I have, in the military, traveled around. And I've been in different churches. We have, it it tells us in Ephesians, that our pastor is a gift. We have been given a great pastor. Him and Michelle, the time that they put in this church and the time they, put, they pour into the congregation, we have been given much. We need to make sure we have a place to worship. This building is awesome. But what makes this building awesome is not the walls and the mortar and the roof, it's the people. The sermons that he preaches and every preacher that stands up here with me, me included tonight, everything that comes behind this pulpit, he'll give an account for. I will give an account for. Every, for. every time I preached, I will give an account to the Lord for what I taught. But you know what? That goes two ways. Every sermon you and I have heard, we will give, we'll give an account for. These attributes of Paul's life will lead to that abundant life that Jesus wants for his sheep. Only you can control what to do when the Holy Spirit deals with you. Even when we talked about Paul, when he looked over Athens, he saw that city wholly given to idolatry. It doesn't take much to look at Cincinnati, Westchester, and you see cities wholly given to idolatry. You know, it's pretty sad. When, you know, you could have a more, you're more, people are more enthusiastic about sports, about entertainment, 
than they are the house of God. You know, I, I'm one of those, you know, I grew up, I played football, I enjoy watching a game from here and there, not as much as I do. Seems like the older I get, the more I focus on different things and different aspects. Now, my, I used to embarrass my son to, to the utmost. Now, if I'm at a game and I'm cheering for a team, I'm all in. I'm up there, I'm, yeah, go, 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 yell. Dad, calm down, calm down. And those same people, 52,000 of them. You know, they, they're all yelling and screaming, everything is going and really exciting. And those same people, they, 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 if, if they find a church, they go, Oh, when is this going to be over? Move me if you can. Get me excited. Tell me something. You know, that's the problem. We, we don't have our priorities straight. We need to make sure that we lift up the name of the Lord. You know, I like, it, I like sitting back there in my amen, amen corner. We get excited when the preacher's going. That's my amen corner back there. It, it's good. You know, we met uh, Dad. Uh, he was preaching one time. He'd been there before. He went back again. And when he preached there the first time, he didn't, get, he didn't get an amen. So what he did, he got this big bo- uh, cardboard. And he folded it up, and he started preaching. He got to a point where there should have been an amen. He said, wait a minute. He got the little piece of cardboard, folded it up. He goes, can y'all read this? We need one of those every once in a while. And it's just like I've, I've said this statement, and he's, uh, I picked it up from him. Just because you don't say amen, it's not going to stop me from preaching. I'm probably going to be, uh, probably going to go longer. So the more amens you get, the shorter I get. <laughs> uh, but now, see, now you want amen, right? <laughs> you know, it's like I grew up in the South, and if you walked into a church that you didn't hear a bunch of amens, you know, you, so, something's wrong. It must be a funeral service or something. But that's one of the things that we need to be. You know, Wednesday night is prayer meeting. And the most neglected item that should be used in the churches is the altar. Very few times that we, you know, we have altars opening on Sundays, Wednesdays. When, every time a message is preached, the only time most can find time for church is one hour on Sunday. And many have now neglected that and they've come up with different reasons why they just can't be here. But I'm going to say this, and in closing, if we want that abundant life, and again, that abundant life is for Christians. You know, Paul says, in Romans, all things work together, 828, all things work together again for the called. The world, it, it not, everything is not going to be working together for them. They're going to, they're when we are, when it's all said and done, and we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier, I was talking about this a little bit earlier this night, we all have that expiration date stamped when we're leaving here. And the one thing that, I want to leave behind. It's, they say it's not what you take with you. It's what, leaves, what you leave behind. That's the life that people recognize. I'm going to, you may not, I know I can't sing, so that's why I have to be quiet in church because I'm just really horrible. I don't want to ruin the service because sometimes I forget and my wife has to poke me. Shh, they can hear you. <laughs> uh, but I enjoy it. But one of the things I want to be remembered for is that I showed up. And that should be your testimony, your desire as a Christian. If we want the abundant life, we've got those, just those five things that we talked about tonight. Those are things that Paul, in every church that he went to, he made sure that he stressed those. 
and they had a, a pastor, a t- pastor teacher is how it's listed. We have a wonderful pastor teacher here at Serenity, and we're very blessed to have him and, and, and Michelle, that all that they do for us. And we have a, a wonderful, I remember, see, now this uh, Sunday, Memorial Day, will be the first time that I came here three, four years ago, maybe three years ago, three or four, I don't remember. It's been so great, I don't remember. It's time flies when you have fun. Uh, but I came here on Memorial Day, and I remember I said, come in, and we, it was in the old, uh, the fellowship hall was the sanctuary at the time, and I told Marie, I looked over and told Marie she was carrying in, but I told her, I said, we are, we found our spot. We had a good church we was going to. I said, this is where we can be used. This is, I said, I like the preaching, and uh, Dad wouldn't hear very long, but he, we had talks, and, he, and again, Dad, if you met him, he, he would tell you just what he thought. He didn't care if you liked it or not. But he, said, he told me, he goes, son, you've got you, a good, you've got you a good pastor here. He preaches line upon line, precept upon precept. And that is what we need. I don't care, when we were in the military going around different places, you know, I'd, I'd shock pastors when I'd ask them a question. Because most of the time, the pastors, when somebody's wanting to come and find a good church, they ask them, what do you have for the kids? What, do you, what kind of programs do you have? What, what, what things are going on? I'd always ask them this question. Do you preach the Word of God, and do you stand on it? Yes, we, we do that. He goes, what else you want to know? I said, that's all I need. And that's all we all need, is to preach the Word of God and to stand on it and support one another by showing up and being here and being faithful. That was the last step, being faithful. That's what we need, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So with that, if you'll stand, we will uh, have a... Just a, one little song, just, just playing an invitation. You can pray, and I will close in prayer. If you need the altar, the altar is open. If not, you can pray where you're at. But remember, as we go through each and every day here, we have, the Lord wants us to have an abundant life. A life that's not going to be great. It's not going to be wonderful. It's not, everything's not going to be great. We're going to have hard times. He said we would. And we live those. And the things that happened this week in Texas prove that. But, This life is not where it's at. It's not, this is not where it ends for a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, I beg you tonight that you make it right. Because we are not promised tomorrow. I I appreciate your time tonight. I appreciate your attentiveness. And... I'll go ahead and close in prayer again. Remember Sunday? There's no Sunday school, so you get to sleep in for an hour or so. But the following Sunday, there's Sunday school at 9.30, so you need to be there. I'm not just looking right at you, Duran. I'm looking at everybody. So let me, uh, Martin, if you would, you close this in prayer. Okay, thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for the fellowship we have with you and all of our brothers and sisters. Thank you, for Brother Terry, for bringing us the word. That's what we stand all for. That, uh, we just want to draw closer to you, and we just need your help to do that. We love you. Just let us know what you want us to do. I pray this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.